Greetings Antique Radio Enthusiasts, welcome to another edition of Antique Radio Archaeology. Today we're going to do something a little bit off the beaten path. We're going to talk about a crystal radio. In particular, we're going to talk about the Steinite Labs crystal radio set from 1924. Now, the Steinite Laboratory radios uh, really kind of have a bit of history behind them. A man named Fred Stein, back in about 1908, started a little electric company along with his brother Leo. And then he got called off to war. And after the war, he came back, and then he restarted his company, only he called it Atchison Radio and Electric Company. And at the time, radios were starting to get big, and crystal radios in particular kind of had an interest for him. And I, I don't know if he had some type of uh, uh, mine or, or what the deal was, but he was selling radio crystals for crystal radios. And... Galena crystals were among the most popular crystals to be used at the time and they're just nothing more than a mineral and you can find them just about anywhere but what he did is he took his Galena crystals and he trade named them Steinite and claimed that his crystals could uh, receive stations up to a thousand miles away and and years later he went on to say that uh, you know, he's glad nobody called him out on it because they were nothing more than a, a rock that he got out of the ground. But it was a great marketing ploy and he did really well with it. And about 1924, early 1924, he wound up producing this little crystal radio that utilized his crystals. So after he started his company and got going on on this particular radio. He had other radios at the same time, tube type radios. He was getting into tubes just like everybody else. But the thing that made this thing kind of stand out is the price. It was only five dollars back in early 1924 and I think it went up to six dollars by the end of 1924. But the thing is it was very inexpensive. So people that couldn't afford a tube radio could pick up a crystal radio. Now we're going to get into the differences between crystals and tube radios here in a little bit, but the main thing is crystal radios don't use electricity so they don't need batteries and they don't have expensive tubes in them. So being able to do the same thing people were doing with tube radios with a crystal radio was definitely an attraction. The only thing is you really couldn't get quite the selectivity or you couldn't uh, produce the, the louder audio that you would get out of a, a tube type radio. So they weren't as practical but for somebody wanting to get into it and wanting to actually experience radio, this was the perfect set to do that with. Now he produced other types of radios through the years and in the early 30s he started producing what they called non-AC or non-electric sets, which really was kind of a, again, he liked to play around with trade names, but the thing is, it didn't, it wasn't really non-electric, it used a light socket instead of an electrical outlet in order to power the radio and they actually got to be very popular and so popular in fact he wound up opening up another company in, or another manufacturing facility in Michigan so he became very successful um, years later he ran for mayor of Atchison, Kansas where he's from he wound up uh, uh, doing well throughout the years before he passed away and what's kind of interesting is his company still exists today and the, the company is called Stein Light. And what they produce now is food processing equipment that's used to detect uh, humidity in almonds and grinds and stuff like that. Grinders he produces as well. Uh, a few other little test instruments used for in the food industry. So yeah, they still exist. That's, that's pretty amazing to see a, a radio company that, that really uh, has existed 
all these years and is still around. So, and they're granted they're not producing radios today, but they're still in the the electronics industry, which is kind of neat. So, let's talk a little bit about crystal radios, how they function. And then I'm going to go ahead and take this thing apart, show you what it looks like on the inside. There's no real restoration work I have to do on this thing. This thing's in pretty good shape. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through um, what's inside of it and explain how it works. And then we're going to hook it all up and see if we can get a radio signal out of it. So let's go ahead and get started on that. So here's the Steinite Laboratories Crystal Radio. It has inputs here, an aerial and ground input, and it has your headphone jacks right here. Now remember, this thing does not use electricity, and the way it gets away with that is the RF coming into it is basically an electrical signal traveling through the air. So it's picking up that RF, and it's using that electricity produced by that RF in order to basically power the radio. Now you have a little coil, it's actually a spiderweb coil that's back behind here and this is a variable capacitor. This here is a little slide slider that is tied to that coil that uh, picks up the different taps off of it. This is your detector. Now this is called uh, a uh, cat whisker and crystal type detector, or crystal detector. Now what it does is it uses what they call a cat whisker, which is nothing more than, I don't know if you can see this, I'll try and get it in there. It's just a little coil of silver wire that uses the end there to touch a Galena crystal that's basically kind of melted into this lead pot. And what it does is you can touch different parts of this crystal and it will find, as you've got an RF signal going through there, it will help find that mo uh, modulated RF signal at certain parts of the crystal. Now, one of the keys to, to using this type of cat whisker setup because what you have is the pots here the cat whisker is attached to this and what you're going to do is you're going to pull this away you're going to move this around and then you're going to touch it to the crystal just barely touch it you don't want to touch it too hard you don't want to touch it too soft and you don't want to scrape it around the crystal because you'll damage it so it was a little bit finicky in how it operated. So here's a schematic diagram of the radio itself and as you can see you've got your signal coming in it hits this coil and this slider will sit there and basically tap the coil to ground. So depending on where that tap is will determine how much coil is present there to help narrow down that RF signal. Now if you remember, if you have seen any of my other videos, we talked a little bit about how an audio frequency and radio frequency are combined. At the transmitter site, you're going to basically superimpose the audio frequency over the radio frequency, so you're going to vary the amplitude of the RF signal at an audio rate. So what that means is when you combine them, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to have a signal where the amplitude of the RF signal is going to vary according to this audio. Now, of course, spoken audio is not going to be this perfect sine wave. This is like a, if you were to put in a thousand hertz tone or something, that's what it would look like. Now, the way this worked is as you come through the coils, you're, you're going to narrow down the particular frequency of that modulated signal. And it's going to come over here and it's going to get to the detector. 
Well, that RF is causing an AC action to take place and where you got plus minus plus minus happening very quickly and the detector is only going to allow it to conduct one direction. So the cat whisker which is on the cathode side is going to touch the galena crystal which is the anode side and it's only going to allow current flow to go this direction. So what happens is you've got a positive current flow so this is what's going to hit the headphones. Now obviously you can't hear RF but you can hear these variations of that signal. So that's what you're hearing is that audio that's left over. So the beauty of a crystal radio is that it's using that RF to produce enough electricity with these high impedance headphones you can actually hear what's going on. Now granted it's not going to be as loud as a tube type radio but it is going to be intelligible. You are going to hear it and I'm going to show you that here in a little bit. So before we do that let's go ahead and take a look at what's inside the radio. Okay so there were only four screws holding it together so I went ahead and pulled those out. Let's go ahead and flip this around and that's pretty much it. That's all that's inside there. And really what you've got is you've got a coil, a spider web coil they call that, and you've got a variable capacitor in there which basically has a plate that's bent and as you turn the dial it moves that plate in and out. So that allows you to have that variable capacitance. The coil itself is tapped and each one goes to these little taps here that are attached to the slider and your detector here, one end of it, the cathode, goes to the phone jack. The anode goes off to the coil and the top of the anode goes to the coil and the top of that capacitor. So as you can see it's a very simple circuit. There really isn't much to it. Um, and the bottom of that coil is tied to ground the bottom of the capacitor is tied to ground so a lot of things are tied to ground there so one of the things that is really important about a crystal radio is that you have a good ground connection otherwise it may not work too well so that's pretty much all there is to it there's not much to a crystal radio there really isn't so let's go ahead and get this thing together and then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get some stuff ready so we can fire this thing up and see if we can't get something out of it. So everything I need to operate this radio is right here. I need an antenna. Now the best kind of antenna you could ever use with a crystal radio is a long wire antenna which is about a hundred feet of wire suspended through trees or from tree to tree out in the backyard or something. Uh, I'm just going to use my little loop antenna which is internal. The only reason I can do that is because my closest radio station is only about you know, three to five miles away uh, is the radio tower so we get it pretty strong and that usually overrides everything else so we are going to pick up that signal I'm sure so I, and I can pick that up with this, this particular antenna. So we need an antenna, the radio itself, a ground connection and a set of headphones. Now you're not going to be able to hear anything through the headphones. Um, I will and what I'm going to try and do is I'll, I'll get a powered speaker and let's see if we can't uh, pick up the audio from the, from the headphones to the powered speaker. So let's go ahead and uh, hook this all up. Okay, so
There's my headphones, my ground wire, along with my antenna. Okay, so. There we go. Okay. So I've got my ground connection, my antenna, and my headphones. Now, like I said, we want you to be able to hear it, so I'm going to use this little speaker right here. It's battery operated. And Okay, so that's it. It's all connected, ready to go. Now the way you tune in a crystal radio, like I said, you have to lift this up off of the crystal. You move it down until you hear something. Oh, there we go. And American University professor Leonard Steinborn. Uh, because Lenny, I just want to reflect uh, on, on what it is that uh, uh, and, uh, and we're listening to live coverage from CBS News. Uh, Leonard Steinhorn, I want to go to you because uh, let's reflect on what it is that the public has just seen. Now I can hear it very well in the headphones. And I don't know, I'm going to try and hold the headphones up to the... I don't think you can hear that. But I know you can with this. Okay. So there it is. That's how you do it. All right. The vast majority of Americans believe now that our democracy is under threat. Look at these numbers. 66% of Americans believe democracy. So there you go. That's how easy it was. That's really all there is to a crystal radio. There are real simple little devices that uh, were, you can imagine back in the 1920s, it was just an amazing thing to actually put on a set of headphones. And, and hear radio signals. Now don't forget, a lot of these radio users, they were in cities and towns that had a radio station nearby, so they would pick up that, that local radio station, and for them it was well worth the price to, to have something that they could listen to. A lot of kids really enjoyed the crystal radio um, evolution, and uh, you know, as you can say, I'm still hearing, <laughs> there's still signal coming through it, that's funny. And uh, they have done 
a lot over the years to to get kids interested in radios and electronics. It's nice to see something this old come back to life like this and to see that it's still functioning after all these years. I mean, this is 1924. My gosh, that's, you know, we're talking 98 years old. So, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, I would like to do some more on crystal radios in the future. I do have uh, even older equipment than this uh, when we're talking loose couplers and uh, the old original crystal radios actually used uh, different parts and pieces that were all hooked up together on a table. So uh, I do have all those parts and pieces so we can tr definitely give that a try at some point. Uh, I also have uh, a, a nice little homebrew that uh, I picked up that I really do want to restore. That's going to require a little bit of work on that one, so uh, we, I hope to do that one in the future. But in the meantime, happy restorations, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please hit the like button. If you haven't already done so, please hit subscribe. And I really hope to see you next video. Y'all take care now. Goodbye.